Happy to be here, and uh, I'm really happy to provoke you. I'll give you a hard time, uh, actually a very hard time, uh, but hopefully you can bring something home that can make a difference for you. Uh, I draw on my experience both from small businesses. I've started 27, sold seven, failed about also seven. Uh, I still have about seven, uh, which I'm still working on. But I've also worked for uh, a chair and being CEO for large companies. So uh, I think I can draw from both. I've even started a political party, uh, which is actually quite successful, uh, and a lot of other things. So I hope you can use my experience. Uh, during uh, When we were out there, I asked some of you what is the reason why the business in Belgium is not growing faster? Because your economy is growing only 1%. And your businesses, most of them, are pretty stable. And I talked to quite a few of you, and it seemed like you were maybe more or less happy with that. So uh, I asked you, what is the reason why there's not more happening? Why isn't... Why aren't you more dynamic, etc.? And uh, the answers I got, uh, I think, fell into like three categories. One was about the government. The government, I'll take off my jacket because now we're going to work. Uh, the government is so complicated, so expensive, uh, that they're making things so dif difficult for us. But so that was one answer. The second answer was about the labor costs. You know, it's so expensive, and the rules, and it's so expensive to hire people and to fire people, etc., so difficult. So that's also a problem. And the second thing was that actually only two or three of you mentioned was the fact that maybe you guys are too modest. And then you look to the, the people in the north, the Dutch, you know, they think they're, they're the best in the world for everything. They aren't. The Danes are the best in the world. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so, but you are sort of too modest. And uh, my job is to beef you up, make things happen, make you walk home from this and say, wow, why have we not aimed at becoming the best in the world? Uh, some people actually start from what they call a burning platform. For the time being, the banks feel they have a burning platform, uh, and then they need to do something. Uh, I, I don't do that. I start from a burning ambition. And that ambition is to inspire people to build companies that matter that matter, which means that they make a positive contribution to society. And I spend most of my working time in China because I've been engaged with a, a, what's called the Ditao Academy, Master's Academy. I've been engaged to actually share knowledge with Chinese businesses about how they can uh, compete with Western businesses and eventually take them out of the market. Uh, so that's what I spent most of my time with. And I've had this question a lot of times. Why am I not doing, doing it for European companies? And I only have one answer, be my guest. I'd be happy to do it. And I am actually doing it also for some European companies. Now, the, I have a recipe for you that you are actually uh, perfectly welcome to take home. This is a very simple recipe for becoming a world leader in your industry. The recipe is simple, but to do it is difficult, which is the reason why uh, not so many companies do it. It's also difficult for the Chinese, but they have sort of, it when, once they get it, they move forward like crazy. 
Uh, the Europeans will maybe get it, and then it'll take a long time before they move. Uh, and I can't advise uh, you to do that. I advise you to actually, if you get it, do it. The recipe is simple. It, it's about fundamentally changing your mindset for how you lead your business, how you develop the strategy for your business, and how you organize your business. So it's not only one thing, it's actually three things. How you lead it, what is the direction you take, that's the strategy, and how you do it, you organize it, how you make your staff do it. And my experience is that if you get these three things right, you can cr create amazing teams of people, pretty small but they can do, they can have a huge impact. And if I have one, I'm a mathematician, so I, I don't know anything that's useful uh, for anything, but I'm also, I have a specialty, which is the ability to create small teams with a huge impact. And you know where I learned that? I learned it as a scout. And I am a scout. And I, by the way, I'd love to know how many of you have been in scouting? It's okay for one year, maybe you've been for 10 years, I've been for 50 years, but I'd like you to raise your hand, tell me how many of you have been a scout? Yeah, not to my surprise, it's more than half. Uh, and this is not special for Belgium, because if you look around the world, around the world, one out of three managers or people with some sort of management responsibility have been a scout. Average three years. So that's where I learned it. I'm sure some of you have learned it that way and others have learned it in other youth organizations that I have great respect for. Uh, <clears throat> okay, now coming to the leadership question. Okay, uh, the, the conventional leader is a boss. And the boss is a person that thinks that he or she, let's call him he, he can control things, he builds on a mandate which is basically a power base, he thinks he can command uh, his staff, his employees to do what he wants them to do, he will pay them as little as possible of course, but he will pay them enough so that they do it, uh, he will uh, obviously sell as much as possible to the customers at the highest possible price and margin. He'll buy from suppliers as cheaply as he can, of course, because what's his focus? That's the bottom line. Okay, he will of course communicate and tell everybody what he wants them to hear, and uh, so he is a boss. Now, if that's your mindset, I would love you to be my competitor. Because in that case, I can give you a hard time. And the way to give you a hard time is to do exactly the opposite. To be an unboss. The unboss is not a master. She is a servant. I call her she, okay? The unboss is a servant while the boss is a master. The unboss doesn't lead through a power base and through commanding people to do things, the onboss will lead through engaging and inspiring people to do their best. The boss is focused on the bottom line. So the boss is focused on making money, while the onboss is focused on creating value. The boss has a limited view of his company, consisting of obviously whoever works for him and the buildings and the, the equipment and whatever and intellectual property rights that he, or she, he has, while the unboss has a much wider view on the company. She actually considers her customers part of the company, her suppliers to be part of the company, the end users, their associations, part of the company, and of course, 
looks upon the employees not as employees, but as associates. The boss will market to consumers. The unboss will matter to people. Did you get it? Don't market to consumers. Start mattering to people. The unboss is driven by a purpose which is higher than just making money. And I would be prepared to, com to compete with any boss and make more money than him. Because I don't focus on making money. I focus on making a difference, a positive difference to people. Which is why the customers will love the on boss. The customers will often hate the boss. The suppliers will need to love the boss because he gives them business, but really doesn't like the boss. The suppliers will love to work with the on boss. So the difference is that you're creating a much wider ecosystem of suppliers and customers and advisors and others. You create, and of course, employees or associates. You're creating a much larger ecosystem, which is the business. If you want to manage that, of course, you cannot command and use power because the customers won't accept the using powers and neither will others. So therefore, the unboss is a person that leads through inspiration and leads through creating an inner motivation with her people so that they want to follow her, they want to do their best, they want to be part of the show. That's what the on-boss does. Now, for strategy, the boss will, of course, do the analysis where, you know, we have the different customer segments, and that's where we can make money, and that's where we can't make so much money, and this is growing, this is not so much growing. So the boss will design his strategy from fundamentally a financial point of view, because what matters to the boss is the bottom line. Of course, he has to satisfy the shareholders. The unboss will create value for all stakeholders, which means customers, suppliers, users, intermediaries, whoever they are. That's why the unboss will start defining the purpose of the company in a different way than the boss. Uh, I, the first time I realized that was when I ran a hearing aid company, hearing aids, hearing aid company. And all the competition was trying to make as much money as they could, selling as many hearing aids at the highest possible price and margin to as many customers as possible. And by doing that, they focused on making as much money and return to their share shareholders. And everybody was competing in that red ocean. Our company chose a different strategy because we redefined our purpose. It's not about selling hearing aids. It's about making those people who are hard of hearing, making them smile. So we redefined our industry to be the smile industry. And our target group was who was whoever had a hearing problem. And a company that focuses everything it does on making people smile becomes very, very popular. Becomes popular, obviously, with the users, because they may become more happy. It becomes popular with the clinics, because what they want, they don't want hearing aids. They want customers or clients or patients, or whatever they call them, who smile. And it makes everybody happy which is the reason why this company, within a period of five years, went from bankruptcy to the undisputed leader of its industry. Because it started with a purpose that was higher than just making money. And in the end, it made more money than anybody else. We did it again in the pump business, Grundfuss, the world's largest manufacturer of water pumps. I was the chairman for like 18 years. Uh, that part of our business that was submersible pumps for, for, uh, uh, for developing countries, we changed that business 
into not selling as many pumps as we could at the highest possible margin, but we changed it to provide clean water for all. Provide clean water for all. That is a purpose. And we took it very seriously and found out what does it take to provide clean water to a rural village in Kenya. And we developed, we had the pumps, so we didn't need to develop that, but we developed all the services around that would actually allow people in the village to create a profitable business delivering clean water to their fellow uh, citizens in that uh, village. Do you know who came to love us? The UN, the WHO, the FAO, the Red Cross, the Christian Oxfam or whatever they're called. All of these people said, wow, here's the first company who ever focuses on what matters, which is clean water. So they never go out and sell pumps. They say, how can we help you provide clean water to these villages? And of course, Gordon Foss became the market leader by far in that industry because we focused on making a difference, on mattering to people instead of marketing to people. That makes a big difference. And I've done that over and over and over and over and over again. And it works every time. And I'm happy. After this, I'll stay. After this, if you have a question how we can do it in your business, happy to tell you. It's free. <laughs> so, purpose is everything. Because if you have a powerful purpose, which is about making a positive difference to some people, typically the customers, if you have a powerful purpose, you can engage everybody around you for that purpose. And what the Unboss does is to view everybody around you as the company. So I have this small company doing energy consulting. It has only 20 employees, but there are actually over 1,000 building managers who work for free for this company because they changed their purpose from making money on energy consulting into stopping the waste of energy. So they recreated themselves to become a movement for stopping the waste of energy and water, actually. And by doing that, a lot of people, including the government, say, how can we, you can help us stop that waste, fantastic. And we couldn't, we didn't have enough people so that we can consult all these people, but that didn't matter because all these people out there knew what their neighbors ought to do. So we, instead of giving the consulting to everybody, we created a community where they consulted each other. And if you have 1,000 people working for you and paying, paying for it, actually, you can make a lot of money, which was the end result. Uh, a well-known example actually doing the same is Skype. Skype is, have you ever seen an advertisement for Skype? You haven't, because there's never been one. What Skype has done, uh, did, now it's a different story being having a new owner, but what they did originally, it's actually a Danish company, you didn't know that, but it is. Um, Skype actually grew through engaging their customers in selling Skype. So if I was an early customer, and I wanted to do Skype to do free calls to Australia, Skype would, would actually enable me to contact that person in Australia and say, hey, do you have Skype? Uh, no, I, I've never heard about it. Okay, just follow this link, and, uh, and then we can Skype for free with each other. And if you have a problem, I know how to do it, so I'll help you. So I have become an unpaid salesperson for Skype and a customer service representative. There's a reason why Skype has a billion users today. Because they have the greatest customer service on the planet, which is provided by all of us. Fantastic. So that idea of having a clear purpose, which is making a difference to other people, plus engaging customers and suppliers and everybody under that purpose, purpose can be applied in every industry. 
And I'd love you to give me an industry where you think it cannot be done. It can be done. So that is the unlimited organization. If you look inside the company, what matters is to put everybody on the same side of the table. So the whole idea that the, that the labor market consists of the employers and the unions, and we are opposites, and we negotiate in order to bargain back and forth, that's an idea of the past. What we need to do is to engage with the employers, I call them employers, but they are actually associates, to engage with the employees and the unions, get them over on our side of the table, and work together to create value for the benefit of the customers, for the benefit of the company, for the benefit of the employees, for the benefit of the shareholders, for benefit of for everybody. Is that possible? Yes. Is it easy? No. But it can be done. And I have been able to do it in all my companies, gotten the unions on my side to make this happen. One important means to do that is actually uh, shared ownership. And being a super capitalist, uh, you know, I'm not going to give anything away, but what I want to is ha to have all my staff on my side. And therefore, in every single company of mine, is owned, of course, by me, uh, typically as a main shareholder, but then always with the management and the staff as co-shareholders. And not only stock options or warrants, but shareholders. So they've actually had money out of their pocket and paid for shares, which is very important, because the, 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 the benefit of making money compared to the uh, negative benefit of losing money is very asymmetrical. People hate to lose money, and they, of course, love to make money, but uh, you have to have them invest a little bit so that they are also motivated by not losing. So. Uh, so this idea of having shared ownership and having everybody participate in the company is incredibly powerful. The combination of all that I've talked you, to you about has, has actually proven so efficient that we've been possible, and let me take the hearing aid example, we, it was possible for us, as a small Danish company in hearing aids, going to Japan and the market leader, who was that? There were two market leaders. It was Masushita through Panasonic and Sony. And less than five years after we entered, they were both out of the market. Because we created friendships and partnerships with their customers. So they wanted to work with us and not with them. They just wanted to sell hearing aids. We wanted to help them have patients smile. And that's what people like. And uh, then we went to Holland. And got got Philips out of the market, bad luck. Then we went to the US, got 3M and AT&T out of the market, and very quickly, we became the world market leader, and the company still is. Hmm. So, uh, you can do it, and that's actually my point, you can do it. Now, internally, the, the point is that you are used to you don't think actually can be done differently, but you're used to managing through a hierarchy. You're the boss, or whoever is in the boss, and then there are some next level and next level, and, and this guy is accountable to this guy and has command over these guys, all of that. You think that's the only way you can do it. I have designed, and it's written in this book called On Boss, I have designed, and we have designed, a system that is totally different. Instead of the hierarchy, you create three mechanisms. One is to allow each employee, associate, to choose what to do. To select himself or herself what they want to do. It's not allocated, it's chosen. Also, to select which professions they want to be engaged with. And maybe I'm a chip designer, electronics engineer, and I always love to do marketing as well. Be my guest. Now you're a marketing guy as well. And maybe the bookkeepers, they always want to do other things. They hate what they're doing, actually, usually. So they want to do other things. Be my guest. 
get into customer service or education or what, whatever it is. Uh, there's, there's one rule, there's one string attached to it, that you can't do something else if you, if you can't get other people to do what you're doing now. Bad luck. So uh, you have to motivate somebody to do some of the things you're doing now, and then you have time, you can do other things. And you should see the dynamic of an organization like that. And the most uh, common cases is that this bookkeeper says, okay, I'm actually, I can do what I do in 70% of my time, so I have 30%, so I can do something else. Now, that is the, we call it the project mechanism. You choose which projects you work on. The other mechanism is the profession. You choose which professions you want to be part of. And the third one is the people dimension. You choose your manager. So the employee will choose that I want to be managed by you and not by you. Bad luck. What does that mean? It means that those people who are really great managers will be chosen. The employees know it better than anybody. So they will choose the best people to be their managers, and they will respect them because they've chosen them. And they will also respect when this guy, my mentor, he's not a manager, my mentor, actually does a salary review from me, and he does it, he or she, he does it actually by asking my peers. So is this guy really, as he, he tells me he's so good, but is he really that good? And the peers will say, yes, he's actually fantastic. Okay, give him a big rise. That was a hard one for the unions, but you can imagine that. So there are mechanisms of project, profession, and people. There is a clear purpose. There are some values which uh, the whole thing is based upon. And the, 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 the combined effect of that has been, and let me take the, the hearing aid as a first example, uh, that within 24 months, the business doubled with half the people. That is 400% increased productivity. But not only was the productivity much greater, actually the innovation and flexibility became much greater as well. Because within this concept, there's also a physical dimension Get rid of the offices, put everybody in one room, uh, uh, put up a number of tables, not as many as you have employees, because that will force them to move around, because this guy is out today, okay, I'll take his table. This guy is out tomorrow, I'll take ha his table. So you have everybody moving around in the same room, including the CEO, of course. Having done that, you scrapped the departments, so no titles are necessary, fantastic. Uh, and you could actually do away with the rules, most rules as well. We don't need them. And the reason why we don't need them is we have full transparency. If you're breaking the rules, everybody can see it. And some, somebody who is also a shareholder, everybody is a shareholder, will go say, okay, hey, I think you misunderstood something. And uh, so there's a self-controlling, self uh, self-regulating mechanism that makes this company incredibly e efficient. And if you are four times as efficient as your competitors, be my guest, you're the winner. At one time, I, was, I have been competing for some reason always against Siemens. And uh, Siemens is a very large company, 350,000 employees. And at the Oticon hearing eight times, I invited the management, the board of Siemens Healthcare to come to Copenhagen and see our offices, see our research and development departments, walk around, ask any employee any question. Uh, and they said, well, why are you doing that? And I said, okay, come, 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 you should come. And they came. And they kept asking all the time, why am I doing that? Because I'm giving away everything to them. And the answer was very simple. The more you see it, the more you want to do it. But with the Siemens culture, you never can. So you get so frustrated <laughs> that, and you're wasting so much time on trying to find a way to do something you never can do. And it was true. So uh, this is a way where small businesses, and this business today is uh, 6,000 people. At that time, it was like 2,000. 2, 
So small businesses can do things, amazing things. And that's actually what I would hope you could do. Uh, in closing, uh, before I open for questions, in closing, I want to say I'm actually applying this in China. And I have studied Chinese philosophers such as Lao Tzu, Taoism, Confucianism, and the others. And it's interesting how much ancient wisdom about human relationships that points in this direction. Amazing. So, and that's what the Chinese love to hear. So, now I have a task for you. Uh, I want you to just look to your neighbor. And the two of you, within one minute, find the most dirty question you can ask me. <laughs> really something that I don't know how to answer. And I trust you guys can do that. So, it starts now. Find one dirty question together with your neighbor. Now. Time out, time out, okay. I have been told that people from Belgium never ask questions. That won't be the case here. So uh, who is asking the first question? You have to be quick, we don't have so much time. Uh, that was you, and you need a mic, and we need the mic here. Yeah, it'll come there. Okay, be prepared for the next. Yes, quick. if we understood well, you failed seven businesses? Yeah. Um, you told us uh, you succeeded every time uh, with the success formula you have. Uh, what went wrong then in the seven failed businesses? Yeah, very good question. I failed because I picked the wrong people, frankly speaking. It's all about people. And uh, I have become much better to pick good people. And one of the, one of the uh, secrets of that is that I always ask my wife to meet them. <laughs> and she is fantastic, absolutely. You know, I think he's the best guy on earth, and she's, she'll say, no good. Okay, and then out. Who's the next? I, I want a question from over here. Okay, quickly. Yep, we have one here. What can we do to avoid that you're getting into China? <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. Uh, I am actually well established in China and working with quite a few companies, but uh, I, I would be perfectly willing to work with companies, and I am actually working with, of course, a number of Danish companies especially. I'm not working with any Belgian company. If some of you would like to do something, I'd be just happy. We could also organize a little group uh, that would do it together. I'd be entirely happy to do that. So just be my guest. Uh, talk to the Etion people. They're the ones. Thank you. Okay, then we'll have one over here. Be quick, there's one in there. Okay. Be quick, next question comes from over here. How to work against the boss type? Yeah, the, uh, that, that's actually a big problem. You know, how do, you, how do we get these bosses out? because that's what we need. Uh, the, uh, uh, in my view, what, what the, strongest, the strongest argument is to, to demonstrate how much money an unbossed company can do, because that's the only language the bosses respect. And if, if I look at the, the companies I have started and the exits I've made, uh, th this has been, that is, I, I don't think anybody could invest their 
money better than that. It's been extremely profitable. And uh, I am proud to say that, that due to, to this, um, a lot of people, including myself, of course, but a lot of people have become very wealthy. And I think that's perfectly okay. It's not a problem that a, uh, a, a CEO or a, an owner makes uh, 10 million euro out of, uh, euros out of something if, if the staff will each make 50,000 or 100,000 euros. It's not a problem. And uh, that's what I've always been doing, sharing, sharing, sharing. But of course, if you're the main shareholder, you'll make most money, and I've never been criticized for that. And that is the language that bosses understand. So I'm sorry. Okay? Who? Over here. Yeah. I can just point at some of you, but if you do it yourself, it's better. Okay, I'd love to have your question. Yeah. We have a question up here. <laughs> Come on. Uh, what do you do with the people uh, in your company that are not prepared for this uh, unboss uh, typology uh, that uh, cannot yeah. mentally uh, accept shareholdership or ownership? What do you do with them? Um, uh, there are people who just cannot. There are people who are best if you tell them what to do and if there's a very clear framework within uh, which they can work. And I have been very generous to these people since I have always helped them to get a job with competition. If they work for a competitor, this is fantastic because we get rid of a person who is not dynamic, who doesn't want to think new things, etc. And we, so we get rid of the person and we make sure competition gets one. And the more we can move of that kind, the better. And I think I've moved at least 20 people from my companies to competition. I'll call competition and I'll say, okay, this guy is not really, he's actually a nice guy, but he doesn't belong in our company. So take a talk, to, why don't you talk to him? And most likely they're, they're, they're okay people. So they do well there. This also has been a slightly different fashion. Here's a guy who could not accept the freedom and would always buy private things on the company credit card, etc. And I went down to, uh, I didn't take him, to, I didn't have an office, so I couldn't invite him to my office. I went down to his place and I said, hey, you know, seems you can't sort of distinguish between what this, this credit card is for and what it's not for. So uh, can I help you get a job with competition? <laughs> and he got one. Congratulations. It's a very, very efficient way of doing things. And the more you do that, and the, the, the more you show that, that you want these people to work for competition, the more people from competition come and work for you. And then you get the best ones, and they get the bad ones, and you win, which is fine. <laughs> okay, one more question. Will you refuse somebody to be your uh, shareholder? Uh, 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 what will, will I refuse anybody to be a shareholder? Uh, yes, I will refuse some people, but not good people. I will love to have good people working with me for these companies. Absolutely. I'd love to. What's the difference between good and bad people? Uh, I think for me, good people are people who have a broader perspective, who, who obviously we all want to make money, but who wants to do more than just make money to be part of something great, to make a big difference, etc. And that's what I learned as a scout, that we're not just lighting fires and running around in the night, we're actually creating the next generation of leaders. And that's why we're in business, and that's a big perspective. And once you understand this, the whole thing becomes much more meaningful. So I'd love to work with whoever uh, is interested uh, in doing something, let's do it. Last question, who is that? That's you. <laughs> What's the difficulty that in mankind that it doesn't work out like you say? Why mankind in general, man, mankind in general doesn't do that? Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I think there's actually a good reason, which is that in our societies there are very, very strong interests in employers' associations, in un labor unions, and these people have a great interest in doing exactly the opposite of what I want them to do. And therefore, I was so happy to hear that Ichion is sort of moving away from that old model 
and turning into a much more dynamic, partnership-oriented model. And I think Etienne can do a tremendous positive difference in that. And, uh, and of course, these managers who have been picked because of they are control freaks, because they are Excel experts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If they've been picked for that reason, they will try to stick to it, and and they will probably stick to it because their board chairman is the same kind of thing. The only way to get rid of them is to compete with them and win. Thank you all. Get moving. <laughs> <laughs>